Good evening, everybody on Zoom. Good evening to everybody who made it here tonight, which is a very small select audience. I'm going to hand over straight into Chris um, with Jerome, who are going to talk about their forthcoming um, book, uh, which is called When Eve Laughed. But the talk tonight is titled No, How Women Spoke the First Word. OK, so um, I'm Chris. And um, a long time ago, I wrote a book, and it was called Blood Relations, Menstruation and the Origins of Culture. It was published in 1991, and it was pretty well received and reviewed. Um, and um, radical anthropology is we, we bring together um, environmental activists, indigenous rights activists, feminists, and, and people of all kinds, really, who want to help make a better world, as well as, of course, people who just want to learn about anthropology. But we have certainly always been activists, and in that sense, um, political. Um, but what I found when I published my book was that although some of the academics thought it was a very good book, um, my political comrades just didn't get it. They didn't understand what on earth is Chris Knight writing about menstruation for? What on earth has menstruation got to do with um, activism with politics. So rather than try and explain it, <laughs> I can't think of any better way of doing it than go straight to an uh, extraordinary poem. Um, and this poem really puts everything together in a way that, I mean, really it would take several books to explain. So let's go straight to Period Poem by Dominique Christina. So let me be very clear. I wrote this poem with a very specific intent. Um, I have a 13-year-old daughter. It is important to me that I throw every part of my experience and whatever wisdom I've gleaned from that, every, back, every part of my backbone toward her to sustain her, to offer her language that lifts her up and keeps her up. That said, there is, for me, a necessary conversation that seeks to undermine the shaming that happens to some girls around menstruation. Um, I had that experience of starting my period in seventh grade boys, you know, finding out that I had started my period and then, you know, it was some shit. Like, you know, I'd be in the class with the frantic, like, gotta go to the bathroom now, wave, and then you're like, oh, you're in a period, aren't you? Oh, you know, that dumb shit. <laughs> And so, I, so then my daughter, you know, like she starts her period and she's stricken and walks out the bathroom looking like she's died or something. And I wanted to undermine that. So I threw her a period party, my homies rolled up dressed in red and it was red food and red drinks. It was great. And, uh, that's great. It was great. So, you know, all red everything. Fuck it. So, so that's what it was, and it was wonderful. Um, and then when I was in Austin, Texas for Women of the World this year, uh, she sent me a screenshot of a tweet. And in 140 characters, this dummy, you know, damn near uh, undermined my legacy. This is my response to uh, aforementioned dummy. You're welcome. Dude on Twitter says, quote, I was having sex with my girlfriend when she started her period. I dumped that bitch immediately in court. Dear nameless dummy on Twitter, you're the reason. My daughter cried funeral tears when she started her period. The sudden grief all young girls feel after the matriculation from childhood and the induction into a reality that they gonna have to negotiate you and your disdain for what a woman's body can do herein begins an anatomy lesson infused with feminist politics because I hate you. <laughs> there is a thing called a uterus. It sheds itself every 28 days or so, or in my case, every 23 days. I've always been a rule breaker. That's the anatomy part. I, I digress. <laughs> the feminist politic part is that women know how to let things go, how to let a dying thing leave the body. 
how to become new, how to regenerate, how to wax and wane, not unlike the moon and tides, both of which influence how you behave, I digress. <laughs> Women have vaginas that can speak to each other. By this I mean, when we're with our friends, our sisters, our mothers, our menstrual cycles will actually sync the fuck up. <laughs> My own cervix is mad influential. Everybody I love knows how to bleed with me. Hold on to that. There's a metaphor in it. Hold on to that. But when your mother carried you, the ocean in her belly is what made you buoyant, made you possible. You had it under your tongue when you burst through her skin, wet and panting from the heat of her body, the body whose machinery you now mock on social media, that body wrapped you in everything that was miraculous about it and sung you lullabies laced in platelets, without which you wouldn't have no Twitter account at all, motherfucker, I digress. See, it's possible that we know the world better because of the blood that visits some of us. It interrupts our favorite white skirts and shows up at dinner parties unannounced. Blood will do that, period. It will come when you are not prepared for it. Blood does that, period. Blood is the biggest siren, and we understand that blood misbehaves. It does not wait for a hand signal or a welcome sign above the door. And when you deal in blood over and over again like we do, when it keeps returning to you, well, that makes you a warrior. And while all good generals know not to discuss battle plans with the enemy, let me say this to you, dummy, on Twitter. If there's any balance in the universe at all, you gonna be blessed with daughters. <laughs> blessed. Etymologically, blessed means to make bleed. See, now it's a lesson in linguistics. In other words, blood speaks. That's the message, stay with me. See, your daughter's gonna teach you what all men must one day come to know, that women made of moonlight, magic, and macabre will make you know the blood. We gonna get it all over the sheets and car seats we gon' do that. We gon' introduce you to our insides, period. And if you are as unprepared as we sometimes are, it'll get all over you and leave a forever stain. So to my daughter, should any fool mishandle the wild geography of your body, how it rides a red running current, like any good wolf or witch, well then just bleed, boo. Give that blood a biblical name something of stone and mortar. Name it after Eve's first rebellion in that garden. Name it after the last little girl to have her genitals mutilated in Kinshasa. That was this morning. Give it as many syllables as there are unreported rape cases. Name the blood something holy, something mighty, something unlanguageable, something in hieroglyphs, something that sounds like the end of the world. Name it for the roar between your legs and for the women who will not be nameless here. Just bleed anyhow. Spill your impossible scripture all over the good furniture. Bleed and bleed and bleed on everything he loves. Ooh. Period. Well, that's a very hard act to follow, and um, I don't think Jerome or I are even going to try. Um, but let me just say, while I was researching my book, I came across this extraordinary fact that whereas I think it's true to say most academic feminists, certainly those I was aware of in the 80s and 90s, they thought of, in, in either one way or the other, either patriarchy, sexism, and male dominance, well, it's always been like that. There's never been a period of matriarchy. Women have never ruled not only never rule the world, but never even ruled parts of the world. Either that, in other words, that if we want to end patriarchy, we'll have to do something which there's been no sign of ever in all history or even evolution. Or, on the other hand, maybe an alternative position was that, well, yes, perhaps um, women can be equal. A woman can perhaps be as good as a man, but never quite, quotes as good, because, of course, women have menstrual cycles, they have periods, they give birth to babies. Um, maybe you can get 
sort of equal if you go on the pill, or if you maybe don't have children, or if you have children kind of late, but somehow through all those thoughts about possible equality, there's always there's never been a, a glimpse of an understanding that, that quite possibly, as we just heard in that poem, women through having a cycle can have access to a kind of power which is extraordinary. And I just want to read out one um, one myth. In my book, Blood Relations, Menstruation and the Origins of Culture, I deal with a whole number of myths uh, of a special kind. What you, what you find, really, in all hunter-gatherer or early horticultural societies, societies before the development of the state or cities or so-called civilization, where men have a monopoly of ritual power, there's always a story. And the story is that before men took power through violence and rape and, 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 and kept the male monopoly of power through a form of terrorism, before that, women had access to a kind of power which was unfair. Women's power connected to their bodies, connected to the cycle, connected to the moon, was unfair in the sense that men's weapons were harmless um, against it. So I'll just read out one of these, um, one of these stories. It's uh, from Tierra del Fuego, a tribe called the Selknam Una, and it's called the Origin of the Hain. The Hain is the name of this male um, cult. So in so many of these societies, you find what's called a men's house. The men's house is a, is a, is a lodge within which men perform their secret ceremonies, through which men monopolize ritual power. And really, before you had temples, you had these men's houses, so in a way, these men's houses are the sort of earliest form of church or temple or synagogue or mosque, except that, that the myths say that before the men's house, there was always a women's house. And the women's house was a lodge, according to the myths, in which women got together, performed their ceremonies, um, and through those ceremonies, rule the world. So I'll read out this story, The Origin of the Hain, Tierra del Fuego. In the beginning, witchcraft was known only by the women of Ona land. They practiced it in a lodge which no man dared approach. <coughs> the girls, as they neared womanhood, were instructed in the magic arts, learning how to bring sickness and death to those who displeased them. The men lived in abject fear and subjection. Certainly they had bows and arrows with which to hunt, yet they asked, what use are such weapons against witchcraft and sickness? The tyranny of women bore down more and more heavily, until at last, one day, the men resolved to fight back. They decided to kill the women, whereupon there ensued a great massacre from which not one woman escaped in human form. The men spared their little daughters and waited until these had grown old enough to become wives and so that these women should never be able to band together and regain their old ascendancy, the men inaugurated a secret society of their own and forever banished the women's lodge in which so many wicked plots ha had been hatched. Now, what I just want you to see from this myth, and as I say, this isn't just what, this isn't just, I haven't just picked a particular myth. <laughs> what I'm saying is that Wherever you find in the world men monopolizing ritual power, the men say, we stole this power from women. And men feel that unless they practice a kind of terrorism against women, women's natural access to political power through having a menstrual cycle will mean that women rule. Now, of course, um, these, these are myths. And, so, and I'm very often asked, well, is it true? Are these myths true? Was there a time when women ruled the world? And I think Jerome and I are going to be saying this evening that, well, there's certainly no doubt that immediate return hunter-gatherers are societies within which women have an enormous amount of power and solidarity. And the women are not in any way trying to be the equal of men, as if the male of the species was some kind of standard that women had to try to measure up to. Quite the opposite. Women have specific, particular access to a form of connection with each other through the fact of having menstrual cycles. And I just want to mention this fact. It's a biological fact. Um, and it's a subject of huge scientific controversy, of course. 
is it possible, as we heard in, 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 in Dominic Christian's um, poem, when she said, um, when, when we women um, link up with each other, when we meet our friends, the way she put it was, we sync the fuck up. <laughs> a brilliant way of putting the fact that menstrual synchrony is a potential in the human female. Now, of course, there's huge amounts of debate and, and, and argument about this, all kinds of, of what I sometimes call men in white coats, different scientists, they say it's actually impossible for women to, to synchronize. Uh, and and in, in terms of science, it's, of course, still being very much um, debated and, and contested. But one, one thing is certain. The human female has a cycle of a certain length, an average length. So when women are in this, the most fertile period of their lives, in their 20s maybe, the average cycle is about 29.5 days. Now, maybe we take that for granted. Okay, well, it's a menstrual cycle, so it's bound to be roughly the length of the moon. Well, no, chimpanzees could not synchronize their periods, even if they needed to or wanted to. The chimpanzees have an average uh, length of cycle of 36 days, way different from the, le the length of the lunar cycle. Bonobos have a length of cycle 40 days. So the different um, great apes, and you can look at the other primates as well, have, have lengths of cycles greater than or less than the, the, the length of the, of, the, of the lunar cycle. Um, orangutans very close, about 29, point de 29 days. Gibbons pretty close, 28 days or so. Um, but there's one, one great ape which has exactly the length of cycle, average length of cycle, that you would predict if in the evolutionary past it had been adapted for our species to synchronize for women to to synchronize with each other using the moon as a clock, 29.5 days. And what's interesting is that recently, because we've, had, we've now got these menstrual apps which women can wear, um, accurately uh, um, recording lengths of cycles, it, it turns out that if, now that we've got th thousands of cycles as part of our data, that it comes out as 29.5 days on average, particularly for, for, for women who have rough, roughly the, the body mass index of hunter-gatherers, in, in, in other words, reasonably lean, um, lean, lean um, people. Comes at 29.5, and of course 29.5 days, again, I'm, I'm told by um, <laughs> opponents of everything I wrote in my book, oh Chris, don't worry about it. It's just a coincidence. 29.5 days, yes, it's the length that the moon takes to pass through its cycles as seen from the Earth, but it's probably just a coincidence. And of course I agree, it could be a coincidence. But before dismissing it as simply a meaningless coincidence, wouldn't it be best to explore whether there might be some adaptive reason why in the evolutionary past it hadn't been uh, empowering for women and adaptive for women to synchronize using the moon um, as a clock. Now, in, 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 the, um, in that extraordinary poem, we had two claims. One, women sync the fuck up, and it's powerful when women do that. The other, even more interesting in some ways, and certainly relevant to this evening's talk, is the idea that the first word was spoken in blood. Word, I suppose, with a capital W. In the beginning was the word, spoken in blood. So we're going to be arguing that there's truth in that. And I, I suppose just briefly before I, I pass over to, um, to, to, to Jerome, um, why, why do we need a scientific theory to explain the evolutionary emergence of language? Perhaps, perhaps some of you think, well, it's kind of perhaps we don't need a theory. Humans have, evol have evolved, we've got large brains, we're pretty clever, language is obviously useful, language is bound to evolve, isn't it? And, and, it, and, it, and it's, that's a kind of common sense assumption. Um, actually, uh, it's the, the origin of language is nowadays treated by scientists as possibly the hardest problem in science. It's one of those really difficult problems. Um, and I, I could go into some of the reasons why we haven't solved it. I mean, we, we've got um, kind of <laughs> all sorts of paradoxes. I, I, I have a feeling I don't necessarily want to do it. Just, I'm just saying now that, that whereas we, whereas scientists have developed a remarkable amount of agreement about the origin of the entire universe, the first nanoseconds of the existence of the universe, scientists still debate this, of course, but there's a huge amount of agreement about, as to what happened in those the nanoseconds. When it comes to the origin of language, Every single theory that anyone's come up with has proved to be unconvincing and kind of um, unworkable. Um, to the extent that the, that, uh, that there was, well, a long time ago, there was actually a ban 
the, the, the Linguistic Society of Paris in the, in the 19th century actually prohibited all debate on the origins of language because it was thought you'll, you'll just go on debating it forever. There's no way of telling. Um, we're kind of over that now. There's, we've probably got too many theories. There's so many theories that there's kind of information overload. No, there's absolutely no agreement. And the, the leading, for many decades, of course, the, the, the most well-known leading uh, theoretical linguist in the world, Noam Chomsky, um, simply argued, well, language is absolutely off the scale. It's not remotely like any other system of communication in the natural world. Um, and probably some strange macromutation occurred. His theory actually is that a, an ape was wandering around at some point in the past and was hit by a cosmic ray shower. Uh, uh, and, and just by chance, random chance, this cosmic ray shower um, installed, as he puts it, a language organ uh, instantly in the brain of this, uh, this creature who, who that from then onwards had um, had, had the full capacity of a language, but not only the full capacity of a language, but the meanings of all the words that could ever be invented in the future. So we do have these paradoxes um, about how an earth language could, evolve, could have evolved. Um, I think I'll sort of stop because the, the point of this evening's talk is to, is to present our own theory, and the theory is very close to what the, the poem we've heard actually um, stated, but I, th I, th I think perhaps before we get to that, we'll do the PowerPoint and show some 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 evidence. We can't really go into it, but some evidence for what we were we were told in that poem about about the significance of ochre and the possibility of menstrual synchrony. Right. Okay. This is a piece of Upper Paleolithic, that is European cave art, and not so long ago, it was thought that um, we humans became not not merely anatomically, but culturally and symbolically modern through what's termed the Upper Paleolithic Revolution. In other words, when we see in the Dordogne and northern Spain, we see these cave art, cave paintings, that was thought to be uh, the world's first art. Now here we have an image of dancing females from La Linde in the Dordogne. Uh, this is etched on limestone. And just and on the top right corner, you can see the full sort of um, set of imagery, these dancing females seen from the side. And um, just look on the left there. This is, this is um, a photograph taken by Alexander Marshak, who allowed us to, to, to use it because he knew we were interested in this. Um, and um, I, what do you make of it? We have two females clearly dancing together, seen from the side. And can you see the, the etchings connecting, connecting up the vulva region of those two females? Now, my own view is that if you didn't have the concept of menstrual synchrony, you would just scratch your head and think, well, what on earth is that about? Um, it's not proof. We can't prove that it's the synchronization of menstrual cycles. But again and again in Upper Paleolithic art, we find women dancing with women. I don't think there's a single instance of a man and a woman engaged in, as a couple in dancing. It's always women dancing with other women, and when they do dance, there's, there's a kind of rhythmicity to their dancing. They're all obviously dancing the same, to the same beat, to the same rhythm, and in this case, if you look closely, we have, we have their vulvas connected as if that is the point of connection, that is the point of uh, synchrony. So let's move on, next picture. These are pictures in my book, Blood Relations, and again they show uh, rock art from the Pilbara region of Western Australia. Again and again, the pictures are of dancing females, very much emphasizing the vulvas, and on the left there in the photograph, you can see coming out from between their legs this zigzag, zigzag, zigzag rhythmic flow, very, very, very much emphasized. And on the right there, we've got line drawing versions of so many of these um, instances of rock art and you notice that we have on the top left there we have a, a, a female who's actually almost certainly a mythological female a kind of um, uh, a goddess figure um, and her, her out of her uh, of her vulva we, we see a circle indicating the cyclicity of the menstrual cycle I would think and then we find number three there <laughs> we find two females dancing Across so many parts of Australia, we have these myths which say that the world uh, was established by two kind of goddesses, two females in the, in the 
part of the, of the of the Australia that I've researched most, the, the northeast Arnhem Land, they call the two Wawalak sisters. Here, this is Western Australia. There can't be those particular people. But notice the two females, both with their legs apart, um, and clearly, it, it seems to me, menstruating. I don't see what else that could possibly be about. In number six there in the middle, uh, we heard um, um, Dominic Christina saying, when we women get together, we sink the fuck up. Well, number six there, if you can see, can you all see what I mean? <laughs> Those two females joined by the menstrual flow, clearly an image of, of synchrony. And then at the bottom, again, these goddess-like, or anyway, uh, mythological females with this periodicity down their, their bodies, so clearly indicating something rhythmical and cyclical about their cycle. And, and in every case, there's no question about it. Those images of menstruation are images of power. There's not a shred of feeling that this is something to hide, this is something debilitating, this is just an illness, just a sickness. Power comes through having a cycle. That's the message again and again uh, portrayed by these, um, these rock art images. This is again from the same area of Australia that I was mentioning where the two Wawalak sisters come from, North East Arnhem Land, the Yongu people. And this is an example of, of what women kind of do. When they get together, they make these string figures. And a kind of um, conventional topic to illustrate in your string figure is menstrual blood of three women. So in mythology, menstrual synchrony, menstrual synchrony which in the West, by the way, wasn't, wasn't even a concept until a, a paper, I think it was in Nature, you know, something like 19... 78 or something. 71. 71, says Camilla, by Martha McClintock, it introduced for the first time the very concept of menstrual synchrony. Women must have known about menstrual synchrony, but it was such a secret, such, so hidden, if you like, so repressed, that it wasn't even out in the literature. But here, clearly, in, in this part of Australia, it's just a normal thing that you, you illustrate in a string figure. And now here, I, I just, actually, I, I'll just move across. This is a very famous um, image. Um, the Venus of La Salle, um, I think it's about 18 inches high um, on, a, on a piece of, um, of rock. It, it indicates uh, what's often called a Venus figurine, a, a powerful goddess-like female. She was covered in ochre when first found, or, or at least you could, you could see in, in the kind of crevices of this image traces of ochre indicating that she had once been covered in brilliant red ochre. Clearly a powerful figure. And notice what she's holding in her hand, some kind of bison or horn, and it's got 13 notches in it. Well, again, you can guess, I suppose, what does 13 mean? <laughs> but again, it's just so, it's so suggestive. There are 13 moons, roughly 13 full moons or 13 dark moons in a, in a solar year, 13 notches. I very much doubt whether that's just a random figure. It seems to, it seems to be of a piece. She's, she's covered in ochre, she's fertile, she's holding a moon-shaped um, bone and it's got 13 notches in it to me it, it all adds up and and here we have from Zimbabwe an extraordinarily similar figure in rock art um, a, a, a large female her legs uh, apart massive streams flowing from her legs her, her own blood connecting up with the blood of the game animals um, and in the book that was published the, the editor thought it appropriate to simply cut off what she's holding, as if it didn't really matter. Luckily, I was given a, a pre-publication copy, and on the left you can see that she's indeed holding a very similar crescent-shaped object to the, the, to the object held by the Venus of Lascelles, some kind of um, uh, symbolic moon. I suppose the critical thing in here is the way in which this, this um, goddess's blood connects up with the blood of the game animals, as if there's a kind of metaphorical or symbolic equation between the two kinds of blood. Uh, here is from, so from South Africa, from Fulton's Rock. Now this is very important. This is an image, we don't know, quite know how old, pretty old, but maybe not more than a, 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 you know, a thousand or so years ago. No, nobody quite knows, I don't think. But the critical thing is this, that it's, an, it's a picture, a depiction of a girl's first menstruation ceremony. Um, and this, the, f the first menstruation ceremony is, is among the Kalahari Bushmen, and, th and therefore the, the indigenous peoples of, uh, not, so, not so long ago, the whole of southern Africa, it was the major ritual of the society. It was the ritual which was kind of part of the identity of these people. Enormously important event. And the girl, you can see in the picture here, 
there's a, there's an outline, a sort of semicircle. That's the outline of a hut. Inside is the girl in her karos, in her special uh, robe. Inside are women clapping and singing. And all around are women, mostly women, um, acting out um, the role of um, Eland. And inside the hut is the Eland bull. And that actually does connect up very much with that picture I was mentioning out, that it's her blood and the blood of the animals are equated in some important way. Um, and, and you can see that a little bit, bit below the, um, the upper circle of figures, that that's uh, outlined. That's the outline of an eland, the eland being the favorite prey animal of the Kalahari Bushmen, full of fat and very much valued. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see, Camilla, what's, I see what I'm doing. Yeah, I'm using a pointer now. That's, that's the outline of the, of the eland. And what's important to notice is that the men are, in, are around here. They're kept at a distance. They've got their weapons. But you can see somehow that they're, they're careful not to get too close. In fact, what we do know is that menstrual blood is almost like a power of disarmament. Women can disarm men. Women's blood destroys the potency of men's weapons. If they've got poisoned arrows or poisoned weapons, the menstrual blood destroys that. And that's why men are so careful to be not too close. But we also see, I don't know if you can see, I'm, I'm using the pointer again, when the, the men are bending over sometimes, and this man here's not bending over, but can you see, on, they've got erect penises, each of them with a bar across, which it seems to me indicates no sex. And it's certainly true that in these rituals, when a woman's in seclusion, in that powerful ritual state, um, that's a, her blood is signaling for the moment at any rate temporarily um, a, a, a refusal of uh, sexual access to, uh, to, to males. Um, so this is, uh, these pictures are of <coughs> um, more recent images that are of the central Kahala, Kalahari of this ancient ritual. Probably this ritual, the Elan Bull Dance, is the longest surviving continuously performed ritual on earth. There's, there's evidence that this ritual goes far, far back, and not simply because the people, of course, are unimaginative and can't think of anything different to do. There are profound reasons why, when a girl is menstruating, she needs to be just constructed as potent and powerful by her relatives. Um, and and it, it's, it's part of, the, part of the, the way in which the whole uh, egalitarian society is organized, that, 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 ritual, that, the, that, that particular kind of blood is, um, is established as sacred. Perhaps a way of putting it is this. The critical feature of religion across the world, there's all sorts of different things happen in religions, of course, but one extraordinarily valuable idea behind all the world's religions is this, very simple. Some things are sacred. Um, and above all, if the body is not established as sacred, nothing else is. And the way to mark the female body as sacred is to mark it with blood or some substitute for blood. And indeed, we find this is the work of, um, of Ian Watts, who's actually here. I'm not sure he's going to be able to say anything. The archaeology of human origins, um, for those of you who are not familiar with these things, um, on the middle here is that yellow line. This is actually one of Chris Stringer's um, slides. On the left here, we see 300 uh, ka, that's 300,000 years ago. The very first time we begin to see evidence in archaeology for the use of red ochre as to, to, to mark the body is about 300,000 years ago, maybe a little bit earlier. And, and at the bottom here, we see the different fossils to, to which these different periods of ochre use are connected. And in the, in the middle there, we find the, 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 quite a lot later, actually, from the first use of ochre crayons to mark the body, we find shell ornaments, which are also, by the way, linked to, uh, linked to ochre. Now, these are um, pictures um, of the world's first art. We don't have the pictures. What we do have is the crayons used to make the art. Um, and in the middle there, we have this um, piece of, of ochre um, from Blombos. I think it's about 73,000 years old. And fortunately, we see on that piece of ochre markings etched indicating the kind of patterns which might have been um, uh, marked on on the body um, and here's and uh, if we just look at those um, crayons have you know the critical thing about those crayons is the way in which they have sharp beveled edges as if to make a sharp outline of color on some smooth surface and the reason we think that the pictures haven't survived is because that smooth surface was 
was the human body, which of course doesn't um, doesn't fossilize. And here we have um, a, a, a lovely image, really, of the kind of use to which the ochre was put. This is actually from the Himba in Namibia, um, who are they are very unusual people because they're what, they're some of the very few people who have cattle, but who still seem to retain the kind of egalitarian political dynamic, gender egalitarian political dynamic of so many immediate return hunter-gatherers. So these women are uh, marking their bodies as sacred, using that ochre all over their bodies, and this is just before a young woman becomes married, before she's allowed to be um, um, betrothed to a man. The women established kind of who's in charge. Uh, this woman has, has got sisters. She's got solidarity. Respect her. Uh, and this is a, a, a picture from the same culture of the, the way in which the ochre is, um, is, is ground. Um, archaeologists have found that the very first grindstones we find in the archaeological record, long before um, wheat or, or seeds are ground, is actually the grinding of ochre. It's a woman's job. And here this young woman is grinding the ochre ready for a ritual. Of course, she's, she herself is covered in the ochre. And this is how it's used. And these this cosmetics are used by women in support of each other. Note it's not competitive. The, cos the cosmetics are, are used by women to... They, they help each other to look gorgeous. They're putting the, co the cosmetics on one another. And, uh, and there's a laughter about it all. There's a laughter and defiance. They want to look erotic, uh, but, it, but it's very much um, on, on women's terms. Um, uh, and... Uh, oh, <laughs> It's the final picture where some of us, as activists, were tri trying to establish, actually on Long and Greenwich Meridian, we were trying to sort of make a little symbolic ritual point about the need to um, reclaim uh, time. But that's uh, kind of sort of relevant because it w I want to get back now to the, just the, the basic idea that we heard in the poem, that in the beginning was the word, the word set a boundary, the word was a kind of no, a ritual no, um, and I'll just stop now before handing over, I think, to Jerome. What was the no about? What, if women were saying no, and if that was the first word, what were they saying no to? And I'll leave, that, I'll leave this slide on for a moment, simply to bring the whole story up to date. Men have been running the world for quite a few thousand years now, what, 7,000, 8,000, obviously depends exactly where you're talking about and uh, have made a huge mess of things. And particularly today, when we have um, what's going on um, in uh, Eastern Europe, um, we can just see the, 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 the extent to which a toxic masculinity and patriarchy are actually threatening the survival of the planet. Something like that must have been going on when women first established that no means no. Uh, we are great apes. We come from that background biologically. Chimpanzees are not libertarian anarchists. They're not, you know, chimpanzees are quite very severely, common chimpanzees are severely male dominated. Every male dominates every female. With bonobos, it's rather different. Clearly, we must have come out of that. But at some point, women must have got together and established this fundamental rule at the, bottom, at the root of all the world's religions. Some things are sacred. Our bodies are sacred. Our blood marks our bodies as sacred. No means no. But within that no, within that negative, is a joy, a solidarity, a yes to everything that makes us human, to song, to dance, to solidarity, to kinship, to sex, all the things that make life meaningful, but no to rape, no to violence, no to harassment. Something like that um, was the first word. And remember that a word, if it's got relevance, isn't just a, a series of sounds. It's what um, <coughs> uh, philosophers call a speech act, a word is, is, like, is, a, is, a, is an action, a symbolic action, which does something. And in this case, establish the human symbolic um, domain. I'm going to hand over, <laughs> over to Jerome. OK, so um, we're going to sort of fast forward a bit now to uh, contemporary hunter-gatherers to look at the ways that they can help us to understand some of these conditions. And of course, it's important to note that people living today as hunter-gatherers have really uh, been pushed around in all sorts of very important and difficult ways by uh, farming, herding, and other people. Um, but although, you know, obviously their ways of life today are very different uh, in certain respects to those of our ancestors, um, and they are very diverse, uh, uh, distributed around the world between the equators, um, 
they uh, have certain core characteristics, a common set of core features that um, we, we argue in this book and, and others have, like James Woodburn, for instance, in his categorization of immediate return societies, a set of core features that represent the basic human adaptation, stripped of all the accretions and complications that were brought about by agriculture, food storage, state formation, urbanization, and uh, advanced technologies, and more recently, of course, to national and class conflict. So provided that we can understand uh, extant hunter-gatherers not as missing links or survivals, but as living hum human beings representing uh, people who really do understand the basic key phenomena that we need to live well as human beings, they can tell us a good deal about what it means to be human. Uh, the groups I've been working with, uh, you can see some of the ladies here, are from the Congo Basin, and they represent perhaps the greatest number of contemporary hunter-gatherers in the world. Uh, they are both uh, uh, linguistic and culturally very varied. So common to the way of life of these peoples is that they, their, their life is founded not just on political egalitarianism, but it's governed by polyphonic singing rather than by any idea of a state or judges or elders who can command and tell people what to do. Laughter, play, singing and ritual are at the base, uh, the core structures organizing these societies. Tonight I'm going to be mostly talking about uh, the egalitarian hunter-gatherers of Africa. Um, they uh, have a common set of principles uh, that I've just been discussing, where polyphonic singing, play and laughter govern the way that they organize themselves. And I'm going to explain that in a little bit more in, the, in, in what follows. But what's very interesting is that the commonalities between these very uh, different groups suggest that there is an origin at origin, some sort of ancestral culture that was once much more widely spread across much of sub-Saharan Africa. And what's interesting is that when these groups hear each other sing, they recognize one another immediately, despite, of course, not having lived together ever, um, uh, apart from many, many thousands of years ago. And so the rather uh, similar musical styles of pygmies and San appear to have their roots in a period when they were the same population which, according to the geneticists, is sometime between 76 and 100,000 years ago. And the singing style is based on a complex polyphonic uh, style, which is primarily women's responsibility. But it's basic to all communal ritual, uh, and is that it's accompanied by this non-stop singing, and it's women who keep it going. Men often join in with the singing, but they're not committed to it in the same way. Women sing with special intensity, uh, particularly during dark moonless nights, but they also sing during the day when they're walking in the forest, gathering or processing food. And such uh, singing has powerful social and even political effects, being an important means of maintaining strong feelings of sisterhood. Recent genetic studies show that over the generations, hunter-gatherer women across Africa have tended to reside and have children in their own mother's camp. This is called matrilocality. The resulting kin coalitions give women substan substantial leverage in their dealings with men. And this is, of course, in stark contrast to herders, farmers, and, and male-dominated groups where genetics testify to the reverse pattern. A woman on marriage typically leaves her kin to take up residence and have children in her husband's camp under the control and supervision of his relatives. This, of course, disempowers her hugely. At the stage in life when sexual drives kick in, there is always a risk that jealousies and rivalries may break out. And this is one of the big problems, uh, problems uh, one of the big sources of conflict in uh, chimpanzee society, is that as soon as uh, uh, juveniles become uh, sexually mature, rather than play, they start to fight in order to assert themselves over each other for access to sexual, uh, uh, to women for sex, uh, females, sorry. A typical hunter-gatherer camp responds to the uh, uh, emergence of sexual awareness uh, through measures that preserve playfulness and good humor by constraining the destructive potential of sex, subordinating desire to subtly enforced prohibitions and rules. Without this careful management of sexual desire, social life would quickly become chaotic and violent, 
And as we've seen among chimpanzees, it's under these conditions that you cannot develop language. Among the Bayaka, an effective means for constraining desire is the children's spirit play known as Ngoku, sorry, um, <coughs> which you can see in the right corner there. And B Bolu is a, a spirit play which is performed by small children between the age of six and eight years old, or maybe up to 10 or 11, depending on who's in camp. Um, and what it does is it, it teaches both boys and girls how to coordinate effectively in the way that uh, adults do in this society and, in fact, is the basic template for all ritual practices uh, among the Bayaka. So the girls begin in the central camp singing and dancing beautifully, trying to seduce this forest spirit Bolu out of the forest and into camp. Meanwhile, the boys are on a secret path forbidden to the girls where they assemble together and start to prepare the spirit for dancing into camp. As the girls' singing becomes beautiful and their dancing becomes uh, extremely enticing, the spirit is slowly brought into the camp, gradually uh, approaching the girls as they dance energetically. The girls continue to seduce the spirit by doing a particular dance where they uh, approach the spirit with their wiggling bottoms. But they're quick to run away if the spirit comes too close, be believing that they would be seriously harmed should Bolu touch them. And this is, in fact, the beginning of a young girl's understanding of how best to manage the attractions of her body. Some years before reaching puberty, she'll already be aware that male sexual desire, while delightful to arouse, must also be resisted. Meanwhile, the boys are learning that even to touch a girl against her will is dangerous and not permitted. It's not difficult to see how, in this playful way, the otherwise destructive forces of sexuality are subtly collectivized. And in the process of uh, frequent repetition, it's socialized and effectively constrained. Language could never have emerged in our species had the sex drive been allowed to stoke conflicts and generate mistrust in the way it does so often among monkeys and apes. The socialization of sex through ritual is common to all the egalitarian hunter-gatherers of Africa, with the management of sexuality at the core of, the most of their most important rituals. These can be categorized as rituals of reverse dominance, where women's groups take on animal and masculine characteristics and assert their sexual autonomy, notably when it, they're initiating girls into women's ritual collectivities. It's difficult to overstate the importance of this. Sex is the one thing that among primates inevitably fosters rivalries and destroys trust, prompting violence and putting an end to all possibility of play. In the human case, by contrast, even sexuality has been incorporated within a new social order whose founding principle was the lifelong primacy of imaginative play. So we can start to see now one way that sex is controlled sufficiently for trust and a normative order to be established in a social group. But how does the vocal dexterity required to articulate sounds sufficiently well to produce speech emerge? When men, Bayaka men, use their voices in the forest, it's quite, a di quite different from the way that women do. Men want to attract animals, whereas women want to repel them. A woman walking alone in the forest will yodel continuously out of anxiety that she might otherwise surprise a dangerous animal and be attacked. When women uh, travel together in a group, they chat loudly, laugh a lot. The children uh, make lots of noise. They yodel and sing as they gather food. And Benjeli women explain that to avoid danger to themselves and their young children, they try to warn away any animals that might get too close. And that loud talking, laughter and yodeling is what keeps them and their children safe. Polyphonic singing has features that we would expect of a predator defense strategy. By singing in this special way, alternating between a head and a chest voice to create overlapping melodies, even a small vulnerable party of women huddling with their children in the dark can convey the impression of a large, well-organized group. For the strategy to work, the singing must be maintained continuously. For as long as the danger is present, unlike just shouting or screaming, therefore, this kind of vocalizing needs to be emotionally bonding enjoyable and energetically sustainable even when maintained continuously for hours on end in the case that needs this needs repeating uh, sorry in case this needs repeating i'm not trying to emphasize i want to emphasize that i'm not drawing on hunter gatherer ethnography for one reason only 
all linguists and language origin specialists find illustrations for their arguments among humans. Typically, their case studies consist of campus students invited to participate in their experiments. Our point in our book is that language didn't involve, did not evolve under conditions of this kind. While it's true that extant hunter-gatherers are completely modern people, it's also true that their conditions of life share features in common with those of our hunter-gatherer ancestors, the people who first actually invented symbolic culture and language. With this in mind, let's return to the, our scenario of a group of human females singing in chorus to keep safe from predators. Maybe those groups of mums and grannies who could only scream and shout would have quickly become exhausted, making them vulnerable to being eaten once their voices had fallen silent. Those women who discovered the techniques of keeping awake all night while enjoying shared rhythm and song would have been more likely to stay alive. Out of this dynamic emerged a particular style of singing, well illustrated by the Mbengeli, but versions of which are sung by all other Congo Basin hunter-gatherers and the other hunter-gatherers such as the San and the Hadza. A key feature of this style is that everyone's free to choose which part of the complex polyphony to sing at any point. It may sound as if there's no rules, but everyone wants the overall polyphony to sound good, so we'll tend to choose whichever part is sounding thin. There's no single song that everyone must sing, nor any particular uh, single style, uh, 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 straightforward way of singing each song. Each song is composed spontaneously in the moment by the participants choosing a particular melody that they want to contribute to the song. And this melody is inserted in, in the right way, in, with the right timing, in the spaces between the other melodies being sung by the other people around. So instead of, of being uh, stuck to rules, everyone is being creative, inventive, and forever introducing new melodic lines, while at, times respect, while at all times respecting this underlying structure. And anyone can start and stop a, a, a song at any moment. And, and, and when they stop it, they have to start it again. So by layering different melodies, one on top of the other, we, we get the understanding of a sort of a, a melodic recursion that goes on within uh, these, uh, these uh, songs, which, which has some initial resemblances to the way that words are uh, composed in, in sentences. So learning to do this when singing actually uh, cultivates a very particular sense of personal autonomy, where people are not selfish or self-obsessed, but keenly aware of what others are doing while seeking to help by doing something different but complementary. The goal is to make the music powerful and enjoyable, building up from one level swelling intensity to a yet higher level one, and the same basic theme repeated in endlessly variable ways, eventually reaching such a state of togetherness and joy that no one can bear to stop. In an important sense, the Bayaka, like other hunter-gatherers in Africa, have neither a, a state nor any form of government. No one has any right to oblige anyone else to do something. The most that can be said is that these people have government by polyphonic singing. That is, the principles by which the polyphonic singing is organized are extended across a whole range of cultural activities. Everyone needs to develop an acute awareness of what others are doing and which tasks still need to be done. It's almost as if the only way to measure any kind of cooperation, whether in music, ritual, or everyday work, is to feel the rightness, the harmony, and the beauty of the overall pattern from that collaboration. It's now clear that what theoretical linguists term language is less a separate thing than a fuzzy region towards the cognitive extreme of a play music, ritual, words, sentences, continuum. This diagram uh, <coughs> represents the Mbengele communicative spectrum more accurately than labels like speech or song uh, or, or, or mimesis. When speakers tell stories, I'm going to focus on the storytelling in particular, but I mean there are all sorts of uh, types of uh, communication which are disguised, uh, there are some which are spoken, but, but when you come to storytelling, you start to inc include all sorts of other types of sounds, expletives, idiophones, um, music and song, uh, uh, the uh, very exact repeti uh, uh, repetition of environmental sounds associated with a particular 
uh, events that occurred. So if a gorilla was charging somebody, they'll make the sounds of all the leaves thrashing around and the grunts and groans of the gorilla as it does so. Um, and, and that will be a substitute for the explanation that I've just given to you in words. But there are also a whole number of uh, very standardized sounds which are used in storytelling to give a sense of particular actions. So for instance, boo means someone's just arrived or something's just arrived. Te is used to express duration. E is surprise or, or, or fear of something about to happen. Whoa is the sound of uh, uh, watching something really terrible happening, a, a fight or, or, or something else. And there are many, many of these uh, different uh, idiophones. Storytellers typically use these drawn-out expletives and onomatopoeic sounds, and, and they're then repeated and amplified by the audience, so that uh, the, the, the storytelling is not something that just comes from one person, but is, in a, in, in a sense, the whole community joining in constantly returning back to the storyteller uh, responses from the audience as to how they're receiving the story and how they're uh, understanding the story. Um, one technique that brings these, uh, the, the, this range of elements together very effectively is called mwadjo. And uh, in this thing it's called theatrical reenactment. Um, and it's a, a very particular and important form of uh, speech uh, which is essentially a mimicry or pantomime that's used to produce contagious laughter uh, over behavior that's thought of as unacceptable or absurd. Uh, in this context, it's senior women that, uh, that have the, uh, a very special privilege here. They see it as their enjoyable role to bring down anyone who seems to be getting too boastful or assertive. Although there are no limits on what can be discussed, women often focus on men's behavior particularly that of their husbands. In exaggerated tones, with enthusiastic miming, accompanied by laughter, a woman can recount her man's dis dis misdemeanors to shame him. Should he overhear, his fu fury will only encourage her, and other women will gang up against him. Some men leave for a secluded place, others good-humouredly join in and laugh, knowing that only this will stop her. A female elder may start the ball rolling by silently imitating some mannerisms of her target in a way that accentuates its absurdity. One or two companions immediately grasp who the target is and the situation she's enacting and join in the pantomime, laughing all the time. Because laughter is contagious, the whole camp is soon rolling around. After a while, the only person still straight-faced is the man himself. But the laughter continues mercilessly until at last even he gets the joke. The chorus subsides only as he finally joins in, now laughing at his own expense. Self-depreciating laughter is a peculiarly human trait, one that demonstrates our unique capacity to transcend our natural egocentrism. When the target of ri ridicule see sees the funny side of things, he's seeing himself as others see him. His previous behavior was comical because of its incongruity, incongruity with what is deemed socially acceptable. The culprit might have imagined he could get away with it, but hunter-gatherer women adopt a collective perspective on badly behaved males and will do everything possible to bring them back into line. In this way, uh, Mwajo is a particularly unique way of asserting a normative order. And it can break out at any time, but it's particularly frequent when women feel aware of their collective power. And this happens especially during the ritual performance known as Ngoku, when the women, the community of women, take over the entire camp. During these ceremonies, elaborate mwajo performances, very often focusing on the bad behavior in sexual encounters, bad behavior of men in se sexual encounters, provide men and boys with vivid lessons on how women expect to be treated in romantic relations. Because men will be acutely embarrassed by these explicit lessons, they may want to resist them. And women and girls generally feel the need to keep repeating their message again and again in the loudest and most extravagant terms in order to force them to listen. In such contexts, women are under no pressure to devise shorthands. Where a major performance must overcome resistance, the audience will be immersed in each reenacted event as if it were happening in real life. People make all 
six kinds of vocal sounds, but the noise, noises they, they most savour are generally onomatopoeic, onomatopoeic. Despite certain conventionalised aspects, the sounds are still meant to mimic their real-life counterparts, so tend to be long and drawn out. Where audience members have abundant time to savour a module performance, they'll want to prolong each moment and keep laughing again and again. As module sounds or gestures are naturalistically drawn out over time, the performance may come to resemble a ritual, particularly when the audience calls out, do it again, do it again. At other times, however, listeners may need speed and efficiency, in which case performers reduce the gesture in shorthands. When men do mwajur, they're doing they tell hunting stories, and they've developed a sign language uh, when they uh, tell these hunting stories, which uh, you can see in the middle of the picture here. And, and they use this because they need to communicate very rapidly in very concise ways. And so they have developed these signs to do so, these gestural shorthands. Linguists are well aware that when abbreviations begin to be used, gestures inevitably lose their resemblance to their original referent, just as vocal sounds increasingly lose their former emotional and onomatopoeic qualities. The relevance of all this to the evolution of language, I hope, is now becoming clear. Where we find social pressure to speed up, this acts as a deci decisive factor, driving initially iconic systems of vocal or manual, uh, uh, manual gesture to become increasingly abstract combinatorial and grammatically complex over time. When language first burst on the scene, it must have been built upon precursors, prior developments, which, even without words or grammar, already immersed humans in virtual worlds. It was the evolutionary psychologist Merlin Donald who introduced us to the basic idea here. He argued that long before language, Homo erectus must have been developing a range of performance arts. Whereas previous homonyms had conveyed joy, anger, lust, aggression, or tenderness through authentic, hard-to-fake bodily movements and sounds, our ancestors became experts at acting. If someone wanted to let, know, let others know about an upsetting event, they might pretend to sob or cry. Or again, they might want to warn someone about a poisonous mushroom and do this by clutching their stomach and pretending to retch. The technical term here is mimesis a word closely related to mime. Mimesis means acting things out, pretending that you are hungry, angry, or cold, or whatever, in order to communicate that thought. For humans, but apparently not for our primates, relatives, mimesis is a psychologically deep-rooted way of expressing ideas. Any theory of the origins of language must assume a precursor. Setting out from something like Mwajur has a great, one great advantage. We've seen that for words to be effective, ritual action must already have generated the necessary levels of trust. But the point about Mwajo is that it amounts already to ritual action, of just the playful and inclusive kind likely to generate in-group solidarity and trust. So instead of needing one theory to explain the emergence of seemingly extravagant, time-consuming ritual, and another to account for the radically different development of fast and efficient speech, we can realistically picture how these two contrasting outcomes might have been mutually supported and might have mutually supported one another as they co-evolved. According to this scenario, the sounds and gestures of Mwajo not only conveyed meaning, but simultaneously generated the necessary trust and solidarity for them to be taken up and believed. Mwajo is, then, much more than mimesis, incorporating, among other things, public morality, resistant to harassment or abuse, Laughter and egalitarian politics all merged into a single assertion of distinctively human social life. So when language first evolved, it didn't do so in isolation from laughter, song, dance, or imaginative play, but as one development among others, co-evolving with the full range of related capacities on which the successful sharing of thoughts, feeling, and memories depends. Mimsis, mimicry, is the key principle throughout. When a group of Membenjele hunters arrive back at camp, they might tell everyone to expect a meal by mimicking the good food hoot normally given by a wild boar. Or again, when a group of women start to laugh at some male behaviour, they begin their mwajur not with words, but by hilariously acting out that behaviour, expanding their performance in imaginative ways to narrow down what they find so comical and uh, unacceptable. The Bayaka approach may be more fruitful in revealing an underlying continuum. When language first evolved, it did not do so in isolation from laughter, song, dance, or imaginative play, but as one development among others, co-evolving with this full range of related capacities 
on which the successful sharing of thoughts, feelings, memories and dreams depends. By claiming that the first word was no, we are claiming that it was a collective no. First to dangerous predators by groups of women and their children singing for their lives. But as the eff efficacy of keeping predators at bay was understood, these groups of women could extend their collective no to males seeking sexual access without doing bride service, without providing food. It was these collective no's issued by women that established the vocal skills the egalitarian of the, uh, uh, sorry, established the vocal skills, the egalitarian normative context and the creativity needed for language to evolve and thrive in human communities. So that, that might sound rather abstract. So I just want to show you, finish with a very brief film which um, illustrates this. Oh, there's no... So, okay, um, it's kind of questions and discussion, I think, now. Can everyone see us on Zoom? There's about 100 people on Zoom and three people in the room here, or four. Five, <laughs> um, six, five six, yeah. Uh, One of the um, big questions, I think, is when does language evolve? Um, and one of the things that I was wondering is, um, when is the earliest evidence of musical instruments? And is that maybe something that gives us some indication about when language has? So the question for those who are online uh, is, when did language evolve? And what might be the evidence that could demonstrate that language had evolved? Um, and the uh, suggestion was that perhaps musical instruments might be one way that we could see uh, reflections or evidence of this. Um, I know that uh, Chris, Camilla and Ian have a particular answer to that, so I'll, I'll let them, but just to say that you know, with the song being the crucial issue here, um, of course there are very few uh, ways we could find evidence of that. What we need to look for perhaps, and this is perhaps where in, uh, Ian's work is more uh, 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 useful, is evidence of collective ritual action. And so what evidence do we have of collective ritual action? And that returns back to what uh, Chris was presenting in the first part. And I don't know if, uh, which of you would like to talk to that. Uh, well, um, 
I mean, yes, I mean, um, musical instruments aren't necessary, of course, for music, as Jerome's just said. In fact, uh, the, the music we've heard just now from that, those women um, singing the goku, <laughs> they're, they're clapping their hands, they're using their voices. Um, and so what we really need to sort of work out is, is when, did the, when do we think the possibilities for language emerge? Now, what we've argued is that language will not emerge in a world of competition, violence, harassment, threat, because language presupposes quite extraordinary levels. I'm talking now in terms of you know, primates, but comparison with other primates, monkeys and apes, unprecedented levels of trust. Now, when you find mistrust among, non, among primates, great apes, what's the mistrust based on? It's based on sex, really, males jealous of each other, fighting for each other, and so on and so forth. So what we're arguing, really, is that for this, uh, uh, these levels of trust necessary for a language to emerge, females really have to have done something to prevent it being in men's interest to fight one another for sex, which means that women must decide themselves collectively whether sex is available or not, depending on male behavior. <laughs> and the evidence for that is the, is the evidence in archaeology for the establishment of this astonishing principle I mentioned earlier, that some things are sacred, and above all, the body is sacred. And when we find marking on the body, or evidence that the body was marked with either menstrual blood or some substitute, obviously the blood itself won't, won't, won't leave an archaeological signature, but red ochre leaves an archaeological signature. So, I mean, yes, um, musical instruments certainly are found. We've certainly got evidence from Upper Paleolithic flutes and, and so forth, but that, that, that would have been you know, very, very recent. I mean, we used to think, of that, as I said, that symbolic culture goes back to um, the last ice age, maybe 40, 50,000 years ago. We now know that in Africans were far, far, far in advance of any other part of the world, and that symbolic culture was invented by African people, and particularly by women, somewhere around, I think Ian would say, 300,000 years ago. And we think there was no reason why language wouldn't have been flowering at the same time as the rest of symbolic culture was flowering, as evidenced by the ochre. I suppose I just wanted to say, I mean, if you did find musical evidence of musical instruments, like a load of horns, for example, <laughs> you know, just animal horns all together, you know, it'd be brilliant, yeah. Way back when the early ochre evidence was, that would kind of cheat. Well, it would support. be, but we haven't got it, and we don't expect yeah. to find it, because we, we expect that, that singing to be yeah. happening long before artificial instruments. Um, I think but also, I mean, there are many instruments which people use which are made of, you know, very uh, easy to lose substances. Uh, yeah. There's a whole bunch of uh, sort of seaweed type things in southern Africa which people swing around their heads to make a sort of bull roarer sound. But of course, those would uh, quickly disappear. And, and all sorts of things you might rub in nature. And the Bumbenjele, for instance, they play the buttress roots on, uh, on large rainforest trees as, uh, for drums. Um, just with two sticks, and it makes a very effective, deep sound that enters the forest floor. Um, so there are many, many sorts of instruments which, which would not, you know, be an obvious archaeological uh, thing to find. Um, there is a question in the chat from Mark Pizzato. Uh, Mark, do you want to say anything, or, or? Um, it's best to have it from you, it? impossible if you can, Mark. Why did the second so Jerome say that animals never evolve mimetic language when chimpanzees do make consistent, meaningful <laughs> gestures? Do we want to back that up? Well, uh, either, or I don't know. I mean, yes, what's one of the paradoxes, of course, is that um, non human primates, including chimpanzees and bonobos, have all sorts of capacities to do things which they don't use in the wild. So there's no question that, uh, I mean, the, the most famous example, I suppose, is Kanzi, Sue, Savage, Rumbo's um, bonobo. And you could say to Sue, Savage, Rumbo's um, Kanzi, put the, put the orange juice on the hat, put the hat on the orange juice, put both in the fridge, open the, I don't know, all those things. And, 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 and not only does Kanzi understand, but he can respond. Uh, he can even make up, and Timothy's are made up, 
if, if they haven't got the word for radish, they can say cry fruit. If they haven't got the word, I, I don't know, if, 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 if your trainer, like Roger Foots with his chimpanzees, is annoying the chimpanzee, he can say you shit, which is, of course, a metaphor. He's not really shit, he's a person. So, I mean, but in the wild, um, these animals don't um, use metaphor. They don't use you know, iconic signs. Uh, so then the obvious conclusion we draw from that is that when these chimpanzees are in human culture, where we establish the moral rules, they've got all these capacities which, um, which show up. Uh, and so that, that's, why we, that's why we're saying that the origin of language needs to be explained not on the basis of capacity, but on the basis of performance. What is it which enables those capacities to be realized, and those conditions are social and political? I'm, I'm sure Jerome can add to that if you want, if you want to. Well, no, I think that's uh, answered the question very well. Yeah, I mean it's precisely in the in the wild that. Uh, sorry, oh, oh, the camera's working. Amazing, the camera's decided to work again. Okay. Well, I s yes. Here we are. We're both, we're, both, we're both on the screen here. Look. Well, as far as I'm aware, the only <laughs> gestures being observed in the wild of chimpanzees communicating with one another are the what's called the directed scratch. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know this idea that, uh, yeah. you know, groom me just here. Um, <laughs> Um, and, and, and a slight point to the place. But, uh, and but the, near, the, ne the nearest we have to bonobos using an iconic gesture is when the male is putting the, the sort of rump of the female in the position he needs her to be to have sex with her. And so he doesn't exactly physically move her, he sort of sort of physically moves her, but you can argue that he's, you know, it's kind of a signal with his hands. But I mean, those things are extremely minimal and they're, all, they're essentially as well self-interested, like scratch me here. Uh, if the, you know, if a ch if one chimp, uh, what 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 Michael Tomasello points out is a brilliant point. He says that even when you have among a group of um, chimpanzees, um, some little infant has lost its mummy, and everyone knows where mummy is. They can't even be bothered to point um, because it's you know they just haven't got the the cooperative impulses to do that simple thing. They, they, they could point. They got the arm. They got the muscles. They got the fingers. They could easily do it. They just can't be bothered. Um, and so we need to explain how it was that humans, uh, as, a, as a form of great ape, of course, uh, developed as social arrangements and social motivations to make them feel it was relevant to help others with information they didn't have. <coughs> There's a question here. Yes, hi. Yes, it's a double whammy. Yes. Um, but the women also created the space by saying using it in their language. So it's a beautiful idea. It's what Jerome sometimes called a sweet spot. You've got a, you've got, you're doing something which creates its own conditions. If you take, for example, laughter, supposing you haven't got much to laugh about because everything's going wrong. Well, it may be that the laughter which women perform when they laugh, it actually gets the men to behave then because the men are behaving and going away and not hassling the women and coming back with you know, some meat, then the women have got something to laugh about. But, you, but it's like Mojo, as, as Jerome was describing, this form of political laughter like, as a form of resistance, under certain conditions, they're probably quite unusual conditions, it creates its own preconditions. You know, so laughter creates this social and economic security for laughter to be understandable. <laughs> So it's exactly what you're saying. It's, 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 a, it's a kind of sweet spot um, which they, they arrived at where, you know, yeah, where, where laughter created reasons for laughter because laughter itself was political and had economic effects in terms of getting men to behave and bring back food. Where, and then when the food comes back, you're all very happy and you can have a, have a great time. I think the story of this that we're trying to tell is, is one of affordances that... Yeah. People do something which they don't necessarily do thinking, oh, we'll invent language. But it suddenly pr creates a whole new context in which these things suddenly become possible. And, and, and that's really what we're, we're trying to, to, to elaborate in this theory. Well, we have a theory yeah, for that. We, we should okay. repeat the question. Yeah. Okay, so sorry. The, 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 the question here, sorry, yes, everybody, yes. We've, uh, we, we've been asked, if laughter is something which kind of creates the conditions for laughter as well as conditions <laughs> for language, where does laughter itself come from? And um, Jerome and I agree with one of the theories which has been around for a while, 
um, Abelos Feld is the guy I think who uh, initially came up with it. He, he describes laughter as a form of mobbing. You can see when you laugh, when people are laughing, it can sometimes be quite cruel. Ha 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 ha! And, it, and uh, chimpanzees have a kind of wah bark. It's a rhythmic wah bark, which is kind of threatening. Uh, and of course, laughter can be threatening as well. We can laugh at somebody else's misfortune, like somebody slips on a banana skin, and it's funny. We all laugh, and it sounds a little bit like a sort of cackling, mobbing sound. Well, according to I've ever felt, and I think he's right, laughter is mobbing when the when the threat causing the fear and the mobbing dissolves, and then laughter is, a, is is like the relaxed version of mobbing. Mobbing when you've got nothing threatening you because you've you've overcome the threat, and now you're just carrying on that sound because of its because it's bonding and it, and it makes you all feel good and connected. So it's it's like. It's, it, and, and there's many examples. It, it, Jerome and I wrote about this in our article in the current anthropology, Wild Voices. For example, the, the smile. If you think, when did chimpanzees smile? Well, they have a thing called a fear grin. Okay, and he, we can we can have the fear grin. If we're, you know, I, I've got a picture of myself coming down a, 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 a Chessington Zoo, you know, water plunger thing, and we're all <laughs> but when we hit the bottom and we relax, this fear grin turns into a smile. So a smile is a fear grin under relaxed conditions, and laughing is mobbing under relaxed conditions, if we're right. So, so supposing the women in mobbing the men to stop them from harassing them, and then suddenly the men decide, OK, we've had enough of this, we're going to go and behave and, go and, and direct our aggression at some animal to, to bring back some meat, then the women who've been mobbing feel relieved. At last we've got these men to understand, and then what used to be you know, mobbing turns into laughter. So it's like a reversal, in the instance of this reversal principle. I mean, Jerry mentioned reverse dominance. Human symbolic culture is like dominance, but it's, it's reversed because it's, it's like the dominance of the underlying collective uh, over and against anyone trying to dominate. So it's reverse dominance, and reverse dominance creates so many other reversals of which language is one, and, and laughter is another, and smiling is another. So, uh, any, more, any, <laughs> any more questions from over here? Uh, um, I, I, I was going to yeah. just check in with something that came over in Jerome's bit of the talk, and maybe I can just yeah, go on to speak. No, just, just to ask, because it sounded to me as though Jerome was trying to say there was a gendering on w women using repeated, emotionally kind of costly signaling to create emotional bonding. But you were using the example of men's sign language in hunting contexts as, as, as creating the shorthand and iconic. And I, I can understand the logic of that, but it sounded as though you were sort of making out men were doing the shorthanding and, and, and women were doing kind of the long, costly bit. Can we clarify that? <laughs> yes, that's a good point. Um, <coughs> that was a ruse to save time. Yeah. And uh, yeah. thanks for spotting yeah. that, yeah. Uh, Camilla. Um, no, it, it was just simply that the, the men's hunting stories show mwajo, the same thing that women do. When men do mwajo, they don't uh, humiliate and, and shame bad behavior because it causes fights when men do it. Uh, when elderly women do it, it mm, you, you can't really fight them. You just end up laughing along with everybody else. So um, the example by which mwajo can become more conventionalized, much less drawn out, is in fact in the context of men's module. Um, but that doesn't at all uh, preclude women from conventionalizing and, uh, and making shorthands of the, the various behaviors of men that they mock. And uh, it's just less easy to tell in a, in a few words uh, yeah. when you're under time pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Can you say any more to that, Chris? Um. Well, I mean, another whole dimension is why do you even need language? Because if you've got a lot of singing and dancing and ritual, you're all, you're all, but the whole point about a communal ritual, like Nagoku or Jengi, is that it creates a, a, a feeling of togetherness, but also a, a, a kind of representation, which is a collective one, of who we are, what we're all about, what, what we think is valuable, and, and we're all kind of of one mind. So in a sense, when you're all singing and all of one mind, you're all of one mind anyway. You only need language when you're not all of one mind, when you're not performing the ritual, when you come back to being 
like back in the secular world, doing the separate things, each individual in a different space, different time, doing different things. Now, you might be interested in, oh, what's she thinking? What, you know, what did you dream of last night? And the point now is that you're separate individuals, not, not quite sure what you, each other are thinking, but now you've got in common a shared repertoire of sounds and gestures through which you could, if you wanted to, communicate with each other. So, so what the argument is that that we have, t as humans, we have two opposite things. And Jerome was saying they kind of come out; they can all come out of one thing, mojo. But, but if your mojo, your 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 play is being resisted, as it might be, some men might refuse to behave and refuse to take in. So the mojo has to keep on and on and on. But supposing, instead of resistance, you've got interest and, and uh, in engagement. Somebody wants to know what you're thinking, and they're not going to resist. You haven't got to keep repeating the same sounds again and again and again then, of course, you're going to have your shorthands. And so somewhere between those two extremes, ritual on the one hand and speech on the other, we have this, what, what, you know, what, what Jerome calls this, um, this, this communicative continuum. Um, but, but you need both. So you, you, you need to be separate out of the ritual, doing separate things as individuals in space and time in order for you to even need to know what other people are thinking. And then you might need shorthand versions of your ritual repertoire in order to communicate individual thoughts to individual, and one of the points Jerome makes is that is that if you want to say something which is which your audience will find difficult, you don't want to be an individual. You want to be a whole group. In which case, you'd be singing a whole chant <laughs> to ask somebody else to be strong about it. But when you've got something which is not dangerous, which the other person actually wants to hear, then you can afford to just be one individual with one other person listening, and then your shorthands, which we call words. Um, you know, take over. <coughs> and perhaps it needs to be really emphasised that hunter-gatherers have language just as complex grammatically as, as any other people on the planet, if not in many cases more so. The, the, anyone who's tried to work out the, the grammar of, say, Hadzani uh, as a language is extraordinarily complex. So please, just because we are saying that so, in many cases you just do these mimetic calls, whoa, and whoa, all that stuff. It in no way means that under other circumstances the very same people won't have the most extraordinarily complex grammatical sentences when they need them to tell some complicated story. <coughs> okay, we've got some questions. Oh, yeah. We've got Leoncia asking about binary oppositions. How oh. do they fit the development of ritual and language? Is it a kind of reverse dominance? I think we've just covered that, haven't we? Well, we can say a little Ma bit more about um, it. Mm. Okay. Well, it's, it's just that if you're, if you're in the real world, by which I mean the brute world of physical things going on, needing to change reality, and you know, non-human primates exist in reality, then you're going to have to put some energy into every sound you make. You, you're trying to scare somebody, trying to seduce them, trying to frighten them, trying to encourage them, whatever. You're going to have to put some, you're going to have to invest in your signal. But supposing you're navigating within virtual reality, then you can cut down the cost to zero. And then you're into the possibility now of having simply on off of different and what, what are called distinctive features. So put the voicing off or switch it on. You've got a per versus a burr, pin versus bin, nasalize, all these other things which are called uh, which are called distinctive features which you can switch off or on. That gives you the digital aspect of language, of spoken language. And a large part of language is digital in that sense. You can create all the different vowels and consonants to all the world's languages by switching on or off. I think there are about 12 in all. Most languages have much fewer than 12. They only have seven or eight, actually, uh, these called distinctive features. And it costs nothing to, to switch pin to bin. Just, you know, you just add the voicing. Or, you know, so it costs nothing. And that, that's the sense in which language is digital. But the argument is... It can only be digital when you're moving around in the virtual world. If you're in the real world, that's not going to be possible. You're going to have to put some energy into every single signal. Uh, and you won't have a virtual world unless your rituals have constructed it for you. So that's why it comes out in fairy tale then. And that's why we've got the virtual, or, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Go on, Nancy. Through, through Sleep and Beauty and those things where you've got this kind of on-off, you've always got these binary opposites coming through. Well, 
Yes, I mean, in some ways, the major binary opposite is which phase of the moon are you in? As, as far as I'm concerned, I think Jerome agrees. I mean, is it, is it the time of the moon when you should be in ritual mode? And, and, and I think it, that would be waxing moon. Uh, and at full moon, the, the, all the taboos on menstruation and sex and all that stuff are released, and you're in waning moon, when, in which case consumption is allowed, sex, feasting, and so on. So all of the world's fairy tales are fundamentally um, dichotomizing between those two opposites. So we have life versus death. So and, and death means the world of, among other things, the world when you're bleeding, when you're secluded, when you're in ritual mode, and life means when you're coming back into the into the real world of sex and feasting and stuff around full moon. So that's digital. And nothing in, the, nothing in reality is ever digital, including the waxing and waning moon. There's always gradation. But, but in order for humans to know what to do at different phases, we have to have a point of agreement. And it's simplest if there's only two alternatives. And that's why it's so often, as you say in fairy tales, that you have only two alternatives. The true bride and the false bride, this world and the other world, life and death, all those things... Um, because if you're trying to reach agreement with people, you don't want too many alternatives because you don't know where you are. But if you've just got two, it makes it nice and simple. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Leoncia. Um There's a couple more arenas of questions in the chat. One is about Will Smith and whether he should have demanded a mutual apology. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if anybody wants to go there. Um, the other one is from Mark Pizzotto again on Merlin Donald's theori theorizing mimetic culture two million years ago, like pre Homo erectus, mythic culture half a million years ago, which is like the onset of symbolic culture. How does that, or bonobo sexuality in contrast to chimps, correlate with your evolutionary gendered narrative involving male sexual violence and archaeological evidence? Haven't we answered most of that? Does anybody need to say more on that? Well, I think it's worth summarising. Summarise it. Yeah. Summarise it for Mark. Uh, mm. Well, and then you can talk I mean, about Will Smith. Uh, uh, well, okay. I mean, Merlin Donnell had this idea that s at some point, um, and I think he does mean somewhere around Homo erectus, humans began to be good at faking it. I, I think that's the idea, isn't it? Mimesis means faking it. You're not really crying. You're pretending to cry in order to make a point. And it, it's never clear from Merlin Donald why on earth previously faking it was illegitimate. I mean, for example, chimpanzees, bonobos, they, they don't fake it. They, if they want to make a point, they have to, be, they have to demonstrate that they really are angry or aroused or whatever it is they are. And, and as soon as there's any, any individual suspected of faking it, they're likely to be ignored. So, but I mean, yes, I, I, as far as I work, can work out, the, the mimetic theory sort of says... Um, two million years ago. Um, and I, I, I imagine that's maybe okay. I, I would have thought that's probably right. So Linked to Herdy. So I mean, one yeah. thing that really backs up Merlin Donald is, yeah. the, is Sarah Herdy's whole idea of well, corporate childcare. Well, well I, I, I think one of the, the most significant developments in supporting Merlin Donald's idea is Sarah Herdy's cooperative childcare, creation of cooperative childcare coalitions as uh, producing intersubjectivity. Mm. Um, clearly, intersubjectivity is the, is the step into the ability to mesh our emotional states and to um, enable each other to read each other's thoughts is the first step towards language. You can't possibly have language without intersubjectivity. This is well known also from Michael Tomasello's and Colwyn Trevathan's works. Um, so the thing about that is that you would have an initial situation for the development of something like Muadjo happening. Mm. So that Merlin Donald's mimesis, actually we could think of it in terms of Muadjo. And as Jerome was saying, Muadjo is kind of extra than just a, a politically neutral idea of mimesis. Muadjo has political content too. It's got mm. it's it's turn, it, it it has a kind of reverse dominance aspect to it. Um, so I would say that's where where things start to mesh. Does that make sense to people? Yeah, Does and I think there's another point which is around the uh, our eyes. Mm. Um, yes. And yes. you know clearly we have very different eyes to our okay. primate uh, relatives, in that the white sclera allows us to share 
what we're attending to. Mm. And that clearly is something which, along with uh, cooperative childcare, uh, could have uh, been selected for in that context. And since it is something which presumably, I mean, we don't know exactly how old it is, but uh, it must be very old in order to be uh, so uh, standard among human beings. Um, and so maybe this is uh, more evidence to support what uh, Merlin was, was mm. theorizing. I mean, one of the points it would be that although around that time of Erectus, um, what, two, two and a half million years ago, the, 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 the one and a half to two. Right, one and a half to two. Okay. Well, yes. I mean, beginning that that process a bit earlier. But but okay. But the the critical thing would be what the males are up to, and um, it's 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 likely that the males were kind of all over the place, still not all that brilliantly reliable as provisioners. Um, probably you know maybe trying to get a bit of sex by offering a bit of meat here and there. Um, and, and so on, and, it, and you're not going to get a stable, regular pattern of males going away reliably and bringing back meat f from the hunt until until a, quite a lot of m until there's a regular something a little bit more than just Mwajo, There's a regular pattern of resistance to sex celebrations by by women, very much like what we saw on the on the on the, on the film there of of, of Ngoku, um, but only taking up at most half the month. So we have a nice d um, binary division between waxing moon and waning moon, and everything then gets stabilised, and then, um, you know, and then then the whole community will have a shared repertoire of, of terms and language. We really, the, 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 I, I was I was think that the evidence from various fields of of um, glottochronology and of um, looking at different languages and how they evolved over historical time, they seem to mean sort of you know I mean. I don't know that the the world's earliest languages come from a root. I don't know exactly when, but I mean, quite relatively recently, 150,000, 100,000, maybe more. Um, when so that this human revolution really took off, um, and and, and mo anatomically modern humans spread throughout the whole of Africa and then spread across the world. So the earlier period of Erectus um, would, would have been a little bit more, um, a little bit less stable, I suppose. Yeah. A, a lot less stable. Yeah. So Ian's, Ian's <laughs> got corrected me here Ian and Watts saying, is a lot less stable. Ian Watts is, a, is the archaeologist <laughs> in the room and saying, a lot less stable. Thank you, Ian. Yeah. Thanks, Ian. <coughs> Have we got any more questions in the room from our star, star Wars audience here? I don't know if anybody would like to take any more. Um, otherwise, uh, otherwise, I think we've just about covered it. Is there anybody else who would like to put in a question? Um, I can't see any hands up. Perhaps I'll just say one last thing, mm -hmm. which is that sometimes, you know, we can be quite rightly um, um, accused of not going sufficiently into modern theoretical linguistics. So there are all kinds of different schools of modern theoretical linguistics. Um, but actually, the, 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 the story that Jerome was telling about song, now music is always like variations on a theme and Jerome was kind of was describing that, but variations are on a theme. In other words, you have repetition of a theme, a musical theme, but within those repetitions you have certain slots within which you can you know, insert alternatives, maybe a shorthand version of a completely different song. Um, that idea of, of open slots within something which is repeated otherwise gives you what's nowadays called construction grammar. Um, and um, Adele Goldberg is one of the leading exponents of this new version of theoretical linguistic. It's pretty much taken over. So these days, the Chomskyan idea of a language organ with everything in it installed in one fell swoop is pretty much gone. But also, all the other things about Chomskyan um, linguistic is pretty much you know, run, you know, past its sort of sell-by date. And, and construction grammar is now the overwhelmingly, I, was, I think, um, school. And the point here is really interesting is that when, when children play games, they like to have, they love repetition. Um, and then they, they, they love a pattern. Because if, if, if every time a, a little pattern, a little chunk of sound is repeated, if everything can change all the time, the, 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 ch the child can't get hold of it. But if, if there's a huge amount of repetition with, with a, a, a change at just one point, then that's easier to grasp. And then it turns out that grammar isn't some, isn't some strange installed genetic apparatus in the human brain, 
grammar is just those aspects of kind of endlessly repeated chunks of sound, those aspects which are repeated, and the words are those aspects which are changed. And so, yeah, and so it's, it's a much simpler idea of, as to what words and grammar actually are. So grammar is just those aspects of, of, of repeated songs which don't vary. Uh, the, 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 you know, the, the invariant aspect of, of language is, is what we call the grammar. And without those invariant aspects, if everything could change at, at any point, it would be impossible to remember everything and, and, and deal with, with language. I think we're nearly... Um, I think we're coming to an end. Uh, we're still why bonobos did not evolve language. Oh, somebody <laughs> wanted to answer <laughs> why bonobos didn't evolve language in the world. Do you want us to do that? Is that uh, your last go? Well, well I, I just, just to say, I mean, um, the last thing bonobos are going to do is go on sex strike. I mean, the l very <laughs> last thing. So bonobo females have gone in the opposite direction. <laughs> the kind of the, the motto of, of bonobo females is kind of if it moves, have sex with it. So two, d two, two um, bonobo females, you know, w when they come across some lovely food, they could compete over it. And what they do is far more clever. They just lie down, get the genitals together, do a bit of jiggy rubbing. Now they're sisters. They have to sort of construct sisterhood because they tend not to be related when they meet each other. And then, they, and then, they, and then as a result of their... Their, their lesbian bonding, they, they, you know, they, they can beat up any male who tries to take that food from them. But it's yeah. a very different dynamic from, from, a, from a, a regular withdrawal of sex and the kind of solidarity ar around, around but it, that. But, but mm. in, I mean, they, the nervous haven't got to the first base in terms of intersubjectivity. They haven't gone through the cooperative childcare situation yeah, because they, they don't, don't do cooperative childcare. So they don't even that trust one the females don't even trust one another with their babies so mm. so that is you know they're not going into a direction of lang language on that basis Ca have we sufficiently answered that question <laughs> i'm going to have to say that we're coming to time now um and thank thanks i'm glad i'm glad we helped there um, thank everybody with their questions. Thank our audience for being so um, attentive on Zoom. Thank our audience for coming here today. It's really great to see actual people, not many of them. Um, so next week is the last uh, Radical Anthropology before Easter, and we're going to have a really beautiful talk from Denise Arnold on Andean cosmology and archaeo astronomy, and it's a, a rivers of fleece, rivers of song. So it's a really beautiful talk, which is again focused on women's song traditions um, in relation to the, uh, the the kind of the stories of the sky, the Andean sky. Um, so really worse. That'll be a Zoom only. Um, we come back after Easter on April twenty sixth. And we are going to be hearing from Ian Watts on the subject of the ideology of blood. And we hope to be here in UCL again. And I think that's, that's it for tonight, unless anybody's got any further comments. Thank you very much. Thank you. We end? Brilliant. Thank you. We're going to end. And Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.